Um, it's my pleasure to and, uh, uh, and honor uh, to gather today in the first webinar organized by Enric to discuss the critical topics that uh, affecting our daily lives currently, which is COVID-19. Today, we will talk about special topic about research and research ethics. Uh, we'll talk about the challenging facing research ethics committee during COVID-19 pandemics. Uh, this webinar held under the FBH of Central Directory of Research and Health Development uh, Ministry of Health and the Middle East Research Assets Training Initiative, Merity, and uh, uh, the Arab Research Capacity Development Company, ARCT, and the Arab Research and Assets Capacity Development Institute, ARACDI, المعهد العربي لتطوير القدرات البحثية. برحب بالمنصة panelists and we are now talking just a brief about Enric. Enric is a and our guest of honor, Professor Nadia Zakhari, the former Egyptian Minister of Scientific Research, and our guest of honor, Professor Henry Zerman from Maryland University. Uh, Enric founder and honors president, Professor Aza Saleh. And we have uh, the acting head of the Center Administration of Research and Health, of, uh, and Health Development of Ministry of Health, uh, Dr. Amr Youssef. Uh, our many speakers, uh, Dr. Ab uh, Abdullah Adlan, Dr. Amin Abdel uh, Dr. Dayan Marzu, and Dr. Tamir al uh, I want to thank our task force, mainly uh, Dr. Uh, Amira Sultan, she has helped us a lot in this webinar. Uh, Dr. Amr Shbeta and Dr. Hanan Mina. Uh, Enric is now 12 years of, uh, of work in Egypt to facilitate uh, uh, the action between Research Eskel Committee um, and support Egyptian uh, Research Eskel Committee to help them uh, to be consistent with the international quality standard of research. Uh, we plan to achieve this goal. I think we have uh, uh, reached a very important step until now. Uh, now we will have uh, uh, Dr. Amr Youssef. Uh, he can uh, give uh, a short, uh, short speak first. Dr. Aza, you can manage the, uh, the floor now. Okay. Uh, thank you, though, Dr. Haney, for this uh, kind invitation and uh, the well organization of this webinar. And uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, all the attendees uh, and also the panelists from uh, Egypt and from uh, Kingdom Saudi Arabia. Um, and uh, we wish um, a fruitful meeting, uh, inshallah. Um, the theme of this uh, today's uh, webinar will be improving ethics scales and uh, management options in various fields of uh, bioethics along with the role of the researchers uh, and IRBs and the clinicians in COVID-19 era. Uh, and we all uh, both guarantee an uh, especially unique experience for the attendees of the uh, webinar and for the uh, international collaborators here in Egypt. Uh, we are reaching our uh, glorious bust uh, of uh, collaboration with uh, Enric and hopeful a future and waiting for uh, uh, this important uh, event and uh, inshallah uh, its success. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Aum, you don't want to uh, present the uh, RHD? Um, I will postpone it uh, till uh, my uh, five minutes presentation uh, after uh, the panelists, inshallah. Okay, okay, okay. Now we can Professor, start uh, the no, presentation. Professor Nadia Zakhari to give us a talk. Okay. Okay. Good evening, everybody. It's really uh, my pleasure to welcome everybody here. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate the Andrek for. Uh, uh, being added on the webinar of the NIH. Uh, this will enable wider communication and sharing more information. I also would like to welcome some of my colleagues. I don't know whether they are here or not. Uh, Professor Dr. Mustafa Hussain, former Minister of Environmental Affairs. Professor Dr. Sharif Hamad, former Minister of Scientific Research. Professor Dr. 
Mahmoud El Metini, uh, the president of Ain Shams University. I hope they are here. Uh, I would also like to uh, thank Dr. Hani Slim and Dr. Azza Salah for inviting me for this uh, meeting and my uh, welcome to Dr. Amin Abdel uh, Abdullah, Dr. Tamer Hinnawi, uh, Dr. Dia uh, Marzu, and Dr. Abdullah uh, Adlan. Um, as we know that it is great uh, that Egypt carries out enormous clinical trials uh, and the researches concerned with the COVID-19. And of course, such trials face many challenges that most important of which is what we are in now that we cannot uh, communicate face-to-face uh, -face with each other, but you have overcome this obstacle. Uh, also, an important uh, challenge uh, is the rumors uh, around this topic of the COVID-19. Uh, this coincides with what is going on worldwide. It's not only in Egypt, but there are many rumors concerning the COVID-19 worldwide. And as we know, one of the unethical conditions in scientific research is to spread in the media uh, incomplete results and data which are not evidence-based yet. Such unproven results causes dilemma in the medical and public community. Another challenge is trying to have antibodies from those who overcome the disease. And the yield of these uh, antibodies is very little, so we must use biotechnology to overcome this challenge. Uh, also, another important challenge is the clinical trial law, which is very important, as we see nowadays. And I remember uh, that since 2012, when I was yet a minister in the scientific research, we proposed the regulation and the rules for this very important law. Uh, the upcoming ministers continue with this mission. Now, nowadays, we can see how important and crucial it is important to have such a law. Finally, it is a great pleasure to have attendance from all the countries and all the continents and to share together our experience, because I think it is more or less the same anywhere uh, worldwide. And best regards to all and wishing all success for this webinar and this meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nadia. Thank you very much for your presence. Uh, and now let us start uh, our uh, uh, lectures. We have uh, four speakers and uh, at the end we will have uh, Dr. Amr for a short presentation uh, about the, the uh, uh, Central Directorate. And we will have a voice note from uh, Professor Imansot. Uh, I will present the presenters in an alphabetical order. Uh, Dr. or Professor Abdullah Adan, he will talk about the clinical research in the era of uncertainty and experience from Saudi Arabia during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Then Dr. Amin Abdelbaei, he will talk about uh, scientific aspects to be considered in COVID-19 research. Dr. Dea Marzou uh, will present the experience of COVID-19 research reviewing in Ain Shams uh, uh, University, Faculty of Medicine of Enchams, and finally, according to the uh, alphabetical order, uh, Dr. or Professor Tamer Hefnawi will present hypothesis testing and the type of errors in clinical research. Although we, uh, I presented them in an alphabetical order, but effectively we will start by Professor Tamer, and then we will have uh, Professor Dea, Professor Amin, and uh, finally, Akhiran wa laysa akhiran, Professor uh, Abdal. Uh, just one thing I will mention that uh, we need, uh, if uh, anybody wants to ask a question, uh, please uh, do uh, two things. First, you have to write the question in the chat. And the second, you uh, need to mention for whom you are directing your question. Thank you very much and uh, wishing you a good evening and a, a fruitful and valuable uh, uh, meeting. Uh, so please. One thing uh, I would like to uh, to say to Dr. Amr, I'm sorry I forgot your name. To so welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um.
you are very kind and very gentle. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Professor Tamer, please. Okay, you share. Uh, let us hear to uh, Professor uh, Tamer. The floor is you. Uh, joining uh, this uh, meeting. Uh, I would like to express my thanks to Henrik, the Central Administration of Policy and Health de Development for this opportunity. I'm going to talk today about uh, uh, an important topic, which is the hypothesis testing and types of error in clinical research. As a start or as a, uh, to pave the road for the main objective of our meeting today. As we can see, or as we noticed in the previous uh, few days, uh, a lot of articles have been uh, uh, written on the amounts of uh, paper that have been published on COVID-19 from the beginning of the year till now. It reaches 23,000 uh, paper, published paper, according to what's written by Jeffrey Brenard in this uh, article on the 13th of May. Um, at the beginning of the, uh, the epidemic, uh, it was advised not to use the carpofen and silexo bead. And now, uh, on the 28th of May, we, uh, it is recommended now to use this uh, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. And there is studies that uh, state that they are having antiviral properties against COVID-19. The famous uh, Lancet paper, which was uh, published regarding the solidarity study of the WHO, which uh, advised or concluded not to use hydroxychloroquine on the 2nd of June, the Lancet uh, issued an, uh, an article that they, there is a concern. And I think yesterday they retracted the article. The very interesting that then the WHO resumed the hydro hydroxychloroquine again after stopping it, uh, the very interesting uh, article that was published, I, I think yesterday, in the New England Journal of Medicine that was conducted, it was a randomized trial and conducted 800 uh, study participants concluded that there is no value of using hydroxychloroquine. I would like to start from here to ask a question. Is smoking cigarettes safe? A person told me that I smoked cigarettes for 30 years and I suffered no disease. Therefore, smoking cigarettes is safe. Another guy said I smoked cigarettes for two years and I had bronchitis, which turned to chronic condition. Now I discovered lung malignancy. Therefore, smoking cigarettes is damaging to your health. So we have here a hypothesis. Who are we going to believe? We have two hypotheses. Smoking cigarettes are safe and smoking cigarettes are not safe. We need to design a study, but how? Dr. X observed 100 smokers and health problem was found among 800 of them. Only 200 had no health problems. Therefore, smoking cigarette is damaging to your health. Wait, Dr. Y, observed 2,000 smokers and health problem was found among 800 of them. 1,200 1, non-smokers are healthy and our conclusion is smoking cigarette does not affect your health. Who are we going to believe? Imagine that you are invited to the famous show who wants to be a millionaire and you are confronted with the 1 million United States dollars question. This is uh, the situation now. You are given a closed box and you have been told that the box contains 100 bulls, a mixture of white and black bulls. And the question, is there an equal number of white and black bulls in the box? And you have two answers with $1 million waiting for your answer, your correct answer. Don't panic. You are going, you just try to organize your thought. All what you have to do is to choose from only two answers. The two answers are there is equal number of white balls and black balls, and the other is there is unequal number of white and black balls. For facilitation, you have been given two options, facilitation uh, for you. You have been allowed to take 10 balls from the box while being blindfolded. Probably this will help you to make a correct decision. 
try hard to steer the balls before selecting the 10 balls. Now you look at your balls and count them, and here is what we found. Eight black balls and two, eight, two white balls. What can this tell you about the number of balls in the box? Another frustration has been allowed by the program organizer. They allowed you to contact the statistician, and that's what he said. If the box truly contain equal number of white and black balls, 11 possible results can be obtained if you draw 10 balls at a random, and here they are. Here, what? Oh, these are all the options that could be present if you, um, if you uh, try to select balls from the box. This is what we, uh, we actually what we got. Eight black, eight black balls and two white balls. Then he added that although the test results are possible, all, all the, these results are possible, the chance or the probability uh, of occurrence of each is not the same. Some are less likely to occur, and then he calculated the probability of obtaining all options. And here are a, a table that shows the probability. Actually, our situation is the third situation, eight black balls and two white balls, and the probability of obtaining such uh, options was 4.39, which is less than 5%. The sample you have is eight balls and two white balls, according to the, your friend and biostatistician. The probability of obtaining such a sample from this box in which the number of white and black balls are equal so our hypothesis is the number of white and black balls are equal is 4.39, which is less than 5%. So the, this probability is very low. The probability of having equal number is very low. And you have, will have only 4.3% chance to obtain uh, this, uh, this finding that they are equal. So if you decide to reject the idea, there is only 5% risk of being wrong. So, you decide to reject the idea that the box contains equal number and accept the alternate idea, which is that the box contains unequal number of balls at the 5% risk. Congratulations, you did it, and you got the $1 million uh, prize. So a hypothesis in statistics is a claim or a statement about some population or parameter. It's a basically a good guess. The hypothesis may or may not be accepted. There is only one way to find out. That's what we are trying to figure out. The research process begins with a hypothesis about the relationship between two occurrences. People who smoke are more likely to get lung cancer than people who do not or postmenopausal women treated with hormone replacement therapy are less likely to have myocardial infarction, myocardial infunction, infarction um, uh, than those who are not, uh, are not taking these uh, hormones. So the research hypothesis in, uh, is an assumed answer to the study question. The study has either two accept the hypothesis or reject the hypothesis. And this is very important. We are not conducting our study to, to, uh, to, to say that our hypothesis is true or false. We are just accepting or rejecting the hypothesis. And this could be changed according to the situation or according to the, uh, what's uh, present in our hand from uh, technology or in a specific field in the study. After formulation of the research hypothesis in scientific methodology, the research hypothesis is not tested directly. Usually, we test the null hypothesis, and it is uh, presented with H0. The null hypothesis is usually that there is no difference, and we are conducting our study to accept or to reject the null hypothesis. If we reject the null hypothesis, we are going to accept the alternative hypothesis, which is the study hypothesis. And this depends on the p-value. If the p-value is less than 0 .05, uh, 0 0.05, this is the type one probability. We conclude that the null hypothesis will be rejected. And if the p-value is more than 0 0.05, this indicates that the probability uh, uh, um, uh, of error is high and we can reject the null hypothesis. We have two types of error in clinical research, the alpha error and the beta error. 
in the alpha error, uh, in both of the, the alpha error depends on the p-value, the, the traditional level of 0.05 are used for statistical significance and the lower is the better. It indicates the probability of rejecting a statistical, hy a statistical hypothesis tested when in fact the hypothesis is true. So we reject a true null hypothesis. The null hypothesis states that there is no difference and I'm going to reject it and it was true. So rejecting true hypothesis Rejecting true hypothesis is called alpha error or type one error. We use the abbreviation ART. A stands for alpha, R rejecting, and T true. ART, the famous TV channels present in the uh, satellites in the Middle East, uh, Middle East region. However, the beta error or type two error is the probability that the test will accept the hypothesis tested when in fact it is false. It measures the power of the test and the power equal one minus the beta error. The power of the test, which is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is false. So beta error is accepting false hypothesis. If you accept full hypothesis, this is called beta error or type two error. And here we are talking about the null hypothesis. And we use the abbreviation buff for uh, denoting beta error. B is the beta and A accepting F, the false hypothesis. Here is, is, is an example. In a randomized controlled trial of drugs, it may con be concluded on the basis of the results that the new treatment is better when in fact it is not better than the standard of treatment. I'm sorry for talking quickly, but I have 15 to 20 minutes. This is why I'm, I am, I'm not giving any uh, a lot of space for um, explaining or giving um, more examples. In this example here, what is our null hypothesis? Our null hypothesis, there is no difference between the two drugs. The results of this study state what? That the new treatment is better and this is wrong. So we reject a true hypothesis. We reject a true hypothesis that says that state that there is no difference. So rejecting true hypothesis is a type one error. On the other hand, a new treatment that is actually effective. So our null hypothesis here is there is no difference. And the alternative, there is difference. The new treatment is better. But the study, our study stated that the new treatment is actually effective may be concluded to be ineffective. So we accepted here the null hypothesis and this is wrong. So we accepted false hypothesis, buff. This is a type two error. In type one error, we assume that the new treatment is better than the standard of care. In fact, there is no difference between them. So we, we got a false positive result, ART. This guy is pregnant and this is false. On the other hand, type two error, which is the false negative, we assume that the new treatment is equal in effect into the standard of care. In fact, there is new, the new drug is better. So we got a false negative result. This gentle doctor told uh, this lady that she's not pregnant and what we are seeing here is just abdominal gases, this tension. And this is false negative. The lower the p-value, the lower the type one error, the higher the significance of the test, and uh, a p-value of less than 0.05 is better uh, than a p-value. Uh, 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 we are going to reject the null hypothesis in this state, and we go, if we got a p-value of 0 0.001, so our level of error is very low in having type one error. Uh, to decrease the type 2 error, we have to increase the power of the test and this uh, is a statistical uh, uh, procedure that can be calculated uh, and we can control this by many factors, uh, which the most important is the sample size. Remember that lowering the p-value will increase the statistical significance, will decrease the type 1 error. But we have to select the suitable test of significance to calculate uh, our p-value.
we have here a very important point, I'm almost done, uh, uh, about clinical significance versus statistical significance. Clinical significance has little to do with statistics and is a matter of clinical judgment, expert opinion. It answered the question, is the difference between groups large enough to be worth achieving? Studies can be statistically significant, yet clinically insignificant and vice versa. And here is the famous uh, pyramid of evidence. We can see that the editorial or uh, expert opinion is at the base. However, the highest level of evidence is obtained by the systematic review uh, of uh, randomized double blind, triple blind controlled trial using meta analysis. And uh, the highest, the, the top of the pyramid have the highest reliability and the uh, risk of bias decrease at the base of the uh, pyramid. Uh, this is my reference. I would like to end my presentation uh, by telling that, that is, we are conducting our study to accept or to reject study hypothesis and it's not uh, our aim to prove that it is true or not true and this is, can be, um, I can describe what we are finding now on contradictory finding from different studies. Thank you very much and I hope I didn't exceed my time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tamer. As usual, presentation is an excellent one, although it's a very difficult uh, uh, topic. Thank you very much. It was clear and I think everybody benefits from it. Uh, if anybody has any question regarding the presentation of uh, Professor Tamer, kindly uh, just write the question in the chat area and uh, uh, tell me to whom it is addressed. Next, now we will follow, uh, we will uh, move to Dr. Adea. Dr. Adea, the floor is yours. You will present uh, your experience in Ancient University Faculty of Medicine uh, regarding uh, reviewing of research in your uh, ethics committee. Thank you, Dr. Adea. Go ahead. Yes. Please. Hello, everybody. How are you? Uh, thank you, Professor Azza. Thank you, Professor Hany. Thank you, Professor Nadia Zakhari. Thank you for inviting me for as a panelist in this uh, webinar. I, um, as, an, uh, as a member of UNREC, I am honored to share my experience as an ethicist since uh, 2006. Uh, regarding uh, this pandemic, we, are, uh, we all have to unify our efforts to fight this pandemic. Uh, I'm going to give an idea about uh, our experience in Faculty of Medicine in Champs University Ethical Committee. Uh, since uh, April uh, 2020, uh, we started to have... Uh, Professor Hany, how is my uh, presentation is going on? Professor Hany? Professor Hany? Professor Hany? Uh, unmute yourself, Professor Hany. It's not. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, we will share now with uh, Dr. Adeo. Professor uh, Azza? Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Hany will share. Yes, uh, give me a minute. Okay, okay. Just, okay. Okay, Dr. Daya, did you see your presentation now? Okay. No, not yet. Uh, no, uh, you are in... Dr. Daya, uh, I am sharing your presentation now. Yeah, Dr. Yes. Hany, please uh, be uh, quite sure uh, to can... share the PowerPoint, not the um, folder. No, I'm... I'm... I don't see it, but if you, if someone else is seeing it, I can, uh, I can uh, look at it in my laptop. But if uh, did you, did you see the, the presentation of Dr. Daya? The rest no, of the no. panelists? No, sir. No, sir. No, they say it's not. We present. are sharing the folder. Please open the presentation and then share it. You are sharing the folder, Yehen. Okay, a minute.
Okay? Yes. Now, okay. Starting. It's starting. Okay. Stop. Uh, is the presentation is now on the screen? On the screen, yes. Okay. I can see it. Everybody can see it? Yes. Okay. Uh, shall I start? Yes, Dr. Uh, yes, Dr. Daya. Yes, okay. I'll give my experience in, uh, in, in COVID-19 research in uh, my faculty of medicine in Chant University. Uh, I would like to share it with you. Uh, with uh, this is my my um, my faculty. I'm honored to be one of them. Uh, my agenda will be, uh, uh, inshallah, establishment of the Faculty of Medicine in Champs University uh, Research Ethics Committee, experience of uh, our ethics committee with COVID-19 research, and the mode of reviewing what to look at in the submitted research, types of clarifications encountered potential risks of COVID-19 research, informed consent, therapy in clinical trials, challenging uh, challenges of reviewing COVID-19 research. Uh, is it going uh, all right? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so the, uh, our Faculty of Medicine and Ancient University Research oh. Ethics Committee, or IRB in, uh, in America, in the States, uh, it started, it, it was established uh, since uh, in October 2007. So we, have, we were uh, uh, working uh, up for 12 years now. And the number of trained reviewers are uh, almost 220 uh, through uh, two, 23 training courses in 12 years uh, for around 32 faculty departments. And the main board team are of various specialties. The REC workload since 2007, we have reviewed uh, uh, international multi-center projects, about 414, with the rate of 25 to, 33, uh, 3, 25 to 33 international projects annually. And the thesis through uh, the MD or the uh, master and the free research about 300 to 400 annually. Uh, so uh, this is the workload, the pie chart for the workload. Um, I, I'm going to speak about the research ethics uh, during pandemics, experience of our, our, of our research ethics committee with COVID-19 has started uh, since uh, this April 2020 uh, and we have reviewed a lot of researches and uh, I found that, uh, thank, thank God that our, our research ethics committee is in the top uh, in Egypt and Africa in conducting COVID research. Nine of the reviewed researchers are registered in the clinicaltrials.com. Some still in process and obtaining the approvals. The types of studies submitted to the committee are clinical trials, observation studies, and surveys. We have tackled a new mode of reviewing. Uh, it, it, uh, the mode of reviewing through the pandemic should be dynamic. And according to the international guidelines and our standard operating procedures, uh, it has been modified according to the current circumstances of the lockdown. It has been conducted through virtual meetings and Zoom meetings. The frequency of meetings have been increased. Now, every week or two weeks, it was then, uh, before it was only uh, a monthly basis, as international guidelines say. Mode of the reviewing has been accelerated, maybe, uh, now we have every day or every other day uh, on a WhatsApp group, we are discussing and rediscussing uh, uh, researches. Lockdown helped us to, to accelerate the review and request of clarifications and reply to these re uh, clarifications and provision of uh, approvals. Two or three reviewers review the submitted project within one to seven days, then discuss through a virtual meeting with the whole REC uh, members with the whole board. Uh, there, are, there is a very important question we have to ask ourselves. What to look at the submitted research? What to look at in the submitted research? First of all, we have to look at the rationale, research rationale and justification. Is it strong as medicine tackled by, uh, as the medicine tackled by many researchers all over the world? Is it weak? 
For example, a supplement, uh, garlic and COVID-19, black seed and COVID-19, or uh, a, a, a drug, for example, used before in a certain disease as HPV, sobosovir, or hydroxychloroquine in malaria and arthritis, or, or, or. Or uh, uh, is it needed? Is this research needed? And all of us, when we, uh, when we uh, discuss or when we review a research, we, we should uh, think about is it needed? Is it of, of social value for our uh, community? Uh, the potential of this research is it going to give a good, good, good outcome? Uh, the idea of the research is it novel or not? Side effects, uh, for example, uh, some examples is QT prolongation with hydroxychloroquine, hypertension, renal problems, and how to alleviate these side effects? How to alleviate them by basal ECG, uh, monitoring by an ECG? How to protect severe cases of COVID-19 as vulnerable cases? Uh, and we have go, we go through the methodology rigorously. Um, this is the average duration of research reviewing. Before the lockdown, it used to be 40 days, minimum one month up to two months. Sometimes very difficult researchers need clarification, requalification, requalification, but the average was one month. It has been short to the minimum mean duration of reviewing nowadays is one to seven days or men, uh, about uh, five days or 4.5 days uh, uh, on average uh, types of clarifications encountered i would like to share with you uh, some of the types of the clarification the study design usually the researchers are in a very great hurry they are uh, they are running to write the protocols, so they um, they have some pitfalls in their study design. So we have to uh, uh, review the study design, and we have to uh, uh, revise it with them, and we have to try to go to the best study design. The target population: the healthcare workers, the mild, moderate, severe COVID nineteen cases. The sample size, sometimes the sample size is not thoroughly calculated according to uh, the guidelines or uh, by a professional statistician. So we go back to the, uh, the PI and the co-PI and we try to help them. Uh, the study sample, some studies are obliged to obtain convenient samples because this is a very new disease. Being a new disease, we cannot take the samples, uh, the random samples that we know, uh, simple random or uh, stratified or uh, cluster, or whatever. We, uh, so they are trying to make pilot studies, exploratory studies, and this is this is what is the you know, you know, this is this is the scene we have. The control groups, uh, we ask them to clarify the standard of care provided to the controls. Sometimes they write it in a hurry. So all the, all the investigators really, they work with us hardly to, uh, to, uh, to, um, to make these uh, modifications or clarifications. The placebo, the placebo, we, we check on the placebo. Are they provided, uh, they provided them with, uh, the standard therapy or not, because most of the pl placebo are, they are patients of COVID. Uh, we have to ask for the detailed standard of therapy for the controls or the placebo. Detailed add-on therapy. Uh, um, for example, how the fatigued subjects will record his daily doses. Sometimes, uh, <clears throat> sometimes investigators re request from the, uh, <clears throat> from the patients to uh, re require, uh, to um, record the daily doses in uh, uh, in in a paper. Uh, so so we felt that they are in agony. They, uh, they their uh, psychological status is not that good. And so we asked the uh, the PI how how could be. Uh, some of them are non-educated. Some of them are um, you know uh, severe cases, so we restricted this to mild or moderate cases only. Uh, the study setting for the subject recruitment we so, some say with the Ministry of Health, some say with some of the hospitals so we we used to uh, uh, let them clarify where is the study setting. The inclusion criteria uh, we asked them to specify the range of age recruited some they some they take their uh, age range from 18 up to 
very old ages. So we asked them to, you know, it, it, just to, um, uh, to, uh, to make the age range uh, a little bit uh, lower or shorter. Add the subjects uh, not receiving other medicines under trial. This is um, a very important uh, point uh, that um, you know, uh, some, some patients could be enrolled in more than one trial. So I will, uh, I will talk about this at the end of the slide. Uh, the methods, detailed study, uh, detailed data of the study procedures are requested. Uh, as I said before, most of them, they write the protocols in a hurry. The, uh, due to the dynamic state of the national protocols, the committee expects an amendment whenever a change of treatment occurs. Usually now we say that the Ministry of Health is dynamically changing the protocol of treatment. So some, some investigators, they, uh, they write the protocols according to the uh, a, a treatment that have been omitted or banned by the Minister of Health. So we say, please, if you are going to change, uh, give, uh, uh, submit to us an amendment uh, uh, frequently or very fast, uh, very rapidly. The ASU uh, Research Ethics Committee requires that the investigators must not allow any of their enrolled subjects in any other ethical clinical trials during the study. So this is one of the points that uh, needs some discussion. We were discussing that. What about if the page of the if the control groups are uh, they are um, taken in more than one trial? So th this is not good for the sake of the patients themselves. Uh, we thought we thought this idea. What, what are the potential risks of the COVID-19 research? Risk of screening of healthcare workers, for example. The main risk is the psychological risk of having being positive PCR. The residents, the young generation, the residents and the associated uh, so, uh, 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 assistant lecturers, many of them have been positive when they were screened. So the psychological status of them is down this should be clarified, as well as the precautions to avoid them regarding the stigma. And how to deal with this uh, as a benefit of this uh, screening. So the trial benefits on screening, the positive participants should receive free management by the PI. And will, will any psychiatric help or referral be given to those who prove to be suffering from anxiety and depression or depression? Speaking about the informed consent, the REC insists on agreement of the legal representative or guardian and not the ICU manager. This was a very strong point that we have discussed in many meetings that the guardian should be the legal guardian. Who will take the consent? One of the researcher teams or one of the researcher team who we asked them. The informed consent will be taken in front of a witness, a witness, a nurse, or a, uh, or a, a physician, or um, one of the responsibles. Signature should be taken of the managing physician as well. How will the interviews be conducted? Face-to-face -face or self-administered? This is a very dangerous pandemic, a very dangerous and very highly contagious disease. So we're, we're keen about the investigator, the patient, the doctors. And the question is, we, we requested them to be anonymous. Therapy in clinical trials, discussion of the used trial drugs and submission of amendments once the national guidelines are changed. The risk management, the adverse events and timely announcement of the REC. And the last slide is the challenges of reviewing COVID-19 research, researches. The sample size, some studies are pilot or exploratory due to the new nature of the COVID-19 disease. Request of notification of REC of interim analysis results. We have, we have to request them to notify us by, uh, by the results of interim analysis. In observational studies, clarification of what would be done on screening of healthcare workers if discovered to be PCR positive. And uh, thank you very much.
Thank you, dear Professor Daya. Thank you. And uh, Hani, you you close the share. Okay. You have the uh, floor you. now, Dr. Azza. Uh, thank yes. you, uh, thank you, Professor Daya. I have questions for Dr. Tamer and uh, Dr. Adia, but I will let them uh, to the end. Uh, now uh, we will have uh, Dr. Amin. Please, Dr. Amin Abdel Baye. He will talk about the scientific aspects to be considered in COVID-19 research or COVID-19 protocols or proposals. Uh, Dr. Amin, the floor is yours. Scientific aspects to be considered in COVID-19 research. القصة بدأت في البداية في 31 ديسمبر 2019 WHO alert to several cases of pneumonia of unknown origin to lead to harm to skin. 7 January 2020 Chinese authority confirmed إن إحنا عندنا new virus هو سبب ال pneumonia clusters. 29 يناير 2020 the first case of COVID-19 in Mediterranean area كانت في الإمارات. The outbreak was declared a public health emergency of international concern on 30 January 2020. On 11 February 2020, the WHO announced the name of the new coronavirus disease COVID-19. On 14 February 2020, Mr. reported the first case of COVID-19 that confirmed. On 17 February 2020, we had the cases of more than 71,000 and mortality that exceeded 18,000. About 2.5 percent this rate. On 11 March 2020, WHO declared this disease as pandemic. Today, we are talking about more than 6 and a half million cases confirmed. It changes every hour and every minute. Confirmed this is about 400,000 cases in all the world. According to WHO and FDA. حسب السي بي سي احنا ما عندناش حتى هذه اللحظه علاج واضح ابروفد فور كوفيد 19 عشان كده كل الادويه اللي بتتاخد هي قيد التجارب السريريه اون اون كلينيكال ترايل وانت سببت لنا مشكله احنا في ورطه كبيره جدا على مش مش احنا في ايجيبت ولا إن ولا في الدول العربيه في الدول كلها تقريبا احنا في ورطه ان انا ما عنديش ستاندر اوف كير للديزيز معلومات عنه قليله جدا 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 كل شويه تتغير مش كل شهر مش كل اسبوع مش كل يوم في كل ساعه نلاقي معلومه جديده عن هذا الديزيز طب مين اللي هيحط لنا ستاندر اوف كير بقى لما يكون الامر بالشكل دون ستاندر اوف كير هتتعمل على المستوى الوطني ناشونال ليفل اوف ستاندر اوف كير اللي حصل ان وزاره الصحه كونت ما يسمى بساينتفيك كوميتي فور مانجمنت اند فولو اب اوف كوفيد 19 كيسز السنتيفيك كوميتي ديا بدات تحط بروتوكول وجايد لاينز ناشونال بروتوكول وجايد لاينز بناء على المعلومات اللي توفرت ساعتها ساينتيفيك ايفيدنس القليله اللي موجوده بناء على اراء الخبراء في هذا الامر اللي كانوا موجودين بعد استطلاع ارائهم والبروتوكول ده بقى يتعمل له ابديت از مور داتا بيكم افيلبل بيتعمل ابديت مره اثنين ثلاثه كل شهر كل اسبوع كل يوم حسب المتاح بالنسبه لنا حسب ما المعلومات الجديده تبدا تتجدد. من كام يوم بس يعني من في حوالي في 30 مايو اتحط الفيرجن 4 فور مانجمنت بروتوكول فور كوفيد 19 بيشنت. يعني اتعمل اربعه فيرجن من البروتوكول ده من اول ما بداناه في تقريبا كان في الاسبوع الثاني من مارس اول ما اتكونت اللجنه. في الاسبوع اللي فات ده في اخر الاسبوع اللي فات ده اتحط الفيرجن الرابع حسب المعلومات الجديده اللي بتبدا تظهر بالنسبه للديزيز الجديد ده. طيب اذا كنا احنا بنقول ان كل الادويه الموجوده هي اكسبيرمنتال ستادي، هل ممكن واحد يجي يقول طب انا زي زيكم انا ابدا اجرب اي دواء باي صوره ما فيش مشكله بالنسبه لنا ما ما فيش ستاندر اوف كير، ما فيش دواء ابروفد لا من الاف دي اي ولا من الدبليو اتش او ولا من السي دي سي ولا من اي مكان فهل ممكن اي حد يبدا يجرب اي حاجه؟ الحقيقه لا ما ينفعش اساسا حاجه زي كده، اي حاجه خارج البروتوكول اللي اتحط على المستوى الوطني، الناشونال بروتوكول اللي اتوضع اللي حطيته اللجنه العلميه المشكله بصفه رسميه من وزاره الصحه، المفروض يضمنه هو فورمال بروتوكول، بروتوكول رسمي يقدمه بصوره رسميه وياخد عليه الموافقه سواء كانت الموافقه العلميه او الموافقه الاخلاقيه قبل ما يبدا يقوم بتجربه اي حاجه جديده على المرض. 
طب وكمان ايه غير كده كمان لازم يكون في تارجت ريسيرش بريورتيز مش اي حد يجيب اي حاجه زي ما قالت استاذتنا الدكتوره دي ويبدا يقول لك انا هجربها اتحطت بريورتيز كمان للايه للحاجات الجديده اللي ممكن تتعمل فورمر بروتوكول وتبدا تاخد موافقه للكلينيكال ترايل على المرض الجديد اللي احنا بنتعامل معاه تخص الدياجنوستيك تخص الترانسميشن epidemiological study, clinical characterization, and management infection prevention and control and so on. ليه؟ لأن أنا محتاج بصفة عاجلة يتجاوب لي على بعض الأسئلة الضرورية عشان أعرف جديد عن المرض دون بحيث أبدأ أتعامل معاه على هذا الأساس. فبالتالي لازم يكون في دارك تارجت ريسيرش بريورتيز. مش إحنا بس اللي حطينا تارجت ريسيرش بريورتيز، تارجت ريسيرش بريورتيز ديًا حطيتها ال WHO على طول، اجتمعت اللجنة المشكلة هناك من ال WHO المسؤولين عن الأبحاث. يوم 11 و12 فبراير وحطوا بريورتيز للايه للريسيرشز الكلينيكال ترايلز اللي هي محتاجين انها تبقى اسرع وتتعمل بسرعه بالنسبه للكوفيد 19 كل الاماكن عملت كده الناشونال انستيتيوت اوف الرجي اند انفكشوال ديزيز حطت برضو بلان للريسيرش بريورتيز وقالت ان انا عندي في البريورتيز دي اربعه بريورتيز ضمنت الحاجات اللي احنا بنقول عليها دلوقتي بالنسبه لنا وهي الفاندامنتال نوليدج بتاعت السارس كوف 2 والكوفيد 19 اللي هي كاركترايز ذا فيروس اند بيتر اندرستاندنج هاو ات كوزز انفكشن اند ديزيز والبريورتي الثانيه كانت ديفلوبمنت اوف رابيد اكوريت دايجنوزيس اند اساي تو ايدنتيفاي اند ايزوليت كوفيد 19 كيسز والثالث بالنسبه لنا كان كاركترايزنج اند تيستنج بوتنشال تريتمنت اوف كوفيد 19 والرابع كان الايفكتيف ان انا احاول ان ديفلوب ايفكتيف فاكسينز آه عشان ابدا احمي الناس سواء دلوقتي او في ما يحصل فيوتشر او دريك من الديزيز دي فالبريورتيز دي لازم تبقى محطوطه في الاعتبار وانا باجي اعمل كلينيكال ترايل للكوفيد 19 عشان ما اضيعش وقت الناس واضيع وقتي وفي حاجه ممكن يتجاوب عليها بعد كده تبقى بوست بوند الاذر تايمز لا ابقى ليا بريورتيز مخصوصه عشان ابدا اجاوب على الاسئله العاجله اللي احنا محتاجين ان احنا نجاوب عليها بالنسبه لهذا الديزيز الجديد اللي هي المعلومات بتاعته شحيحة جدا 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 واللي هو حاططنا في ورطة من ناحية التغيرات اللي ممكن تحصل أول بأول. الساينتفيك أسبكت تو بي كونسيدرد بقى في الكوفيد 19 ريسيرشز بعد ما بقى أحقق الحاجات اللي إحنا قلناها دي كلها أول حاجة الساينتفيك فاليديتي لازم يكون في ساينتفيك راشونال واضح جدا 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 بالنسبة للستادي على أساس إن ما حدش يبدأ يقول أي حاجة ما حدش عارف عنها حاجة قبل كده وما لهاش اي ساينتفيك هيستوري واضحه لازم يبقى في ساينتفيك راشونال واضح ومتبين والباحث اللي هو مقدم البروتوكول ده يكون فاهمه وفي الاوبجيكتيف والاند بوينت والاوت كام والاسسمنت اوف ريسك اند بنت عشان كده اي حاجه خارج الناشونال جايد لاينز اللي اتعمل بالنسبه لوزاره الصحه سواء كانت انفنشنز او انوفيشنز مبتكرات جديده او اختراعات جديده لازم تكون في الاول اتعمل قبليها اللي بالنسبه لها بري كلينيكال ستادي انيمال او لاب ستادي ومش بس كده كمان لا وتكون ببلشت في ساينتفيك جورنالز وتكون معلنه ومعروفه على اساس ابدا ابني عليها التجارب الاكلينيكيه او كلينيكال ستادي اللي انا ممكن اعمل عشان كده الدبليو اتش او عملت الف وقالت ان ما يصحش ابدا ان احنا الحاجات اللي هي ملهاش سابقه علميه واضحه ان انا ابدا اجري فيها في كلينيكال ترايل لان ده ممكن يديني امل كاذب وفي نفس الوقت ممكن يكون ضرره اكتر من فايدته لانه ممكن يعمل لي سورت شورتج في اسينشال درجز ممكن اكون انا محتاجها في ديزيزز تانية خالص كده وندور عليها المريض اللي هو محتاجها ما يدور عليها ما يلاقيهاش طيب هل بقى تسجيل الفكره او الكلينيكال ترايل ده في كلينيكال ترايل دوت جوف ده اساسا مبرر ان الكلينيكال ترايل دي خلاص بقت ساينتفيكالي فاليد واقدر ان انا ابدا اقول والله خلاص ويبقى ده حجه بالنسبه لي ان انا اقوم بيها لا احنا مش فاهمين الوضع كويس الحقيقه الليسننج اوف ستادي هي نفس الكلينيكال ترايل دوت جوف ده الموقع بتاعها حاطط هذه هذا الامر بيقول ان ادراج هذه الكلينيكال ترايل في في الموقع دون لا يعني ابدا انها تكون ايفالويتد باي ذا يو اس فيدرال جفرنمنت وفي نفس الوقت بيقول ان اي حد قبل ما يشارك في هذه الاستادي لازم يرجع للهيلث بروفايدر عشان يوضح له الريسك والبوتنشال بينفيت اوف ذيس ستادي هل الامر دون مبرر ان انت تبدا تقوم بهذه الاستادي الحقيقه لا لازم ناخد بالنا كويس جدا جدا ان مجرد تسجيلك للبحث في الكلينيكال ترايل 
لا يعطيك الحق في البدء في هذه التجربه قبل العرض على الجهات الرسميه واخذ الموافقه الصريحه من ناحيه الساينتفيكالي ومن ناحيه الايثيكالي قبل ما تبدا في هذه الدراسه. والموقع نفسه كاتب هذا الامر امبورتنت موجوده ان انت الليسننج استادي دازنت مين ات هاز بين ايفالويتد باي ذا يو اس فيدرال جفرنمنت وفي نفس الوقت بفور بارتيسيبيتنج ان استادي توك تو يور هيرث كير بروفايدر اند ليرن اباوت ذا ريسك اند بوتنشال بنت موقع نفسه كده وعشان كده هنلاقي على الموقع نفسه لحد امبارح بس عندي 1963 استادي موجوده متسجله عن الكوفيد 19 شوف عدد ضخم جدا من الكلينيكال ترايلز المتسجله بصفه رسميه على الكلينيكال ترايل دوت جوف انما اني فيهم اللي هيبقى ساينتفيكالي فاليد او اني فيهم اللي هيبقى ايثيكالي فاليد الوضع مختلف جدا من ال 1963 كلينيكال ترايل اللي متسجله على الكلينيكال ترايل دوت جوف منهم 53 استادي موجودين متسجلين من داخل مصر بس 53 استادي متسجلين من داخل مصر دول برضو هل هم هيبقوا ساينتفيكالي فاليد او هيبقوا ايثيكالي فاليد دول محتاجين برضو يتراجعوا من تاني من جديد عشان نقدر نقول والله دول بالفعل ساينتفيكالي فاليد او كلينيكالي فاليد ويصح انهم يدخلوا في بالفعل في كلينيكال ترايل ويبدا تجربتهم على المرض شكرا ثانك يو جزيلا دكتور امين شكرا محاضره قيمه جدا ميرسي جدا دكتور امين محاضره فيري انفورماتيف وحضرتك اديتنا معلومات كتير احنا مش مش عارفينها بالنسبه للوضع في مصر وبرضه في اسئله لحضرتك بس هستاذن حضراتكم ان احنا الاسئله تبقى بعد ما نسمع دراسه برزنتيشن اوف بروفيسور عبد الله عدلان ات ويل بي اباوت ذا كلينيكال ريسيرش ان ذا ايرا اوف انسرتينيتي ذا تايتل از فيري انتريستنج ان اكسبيرينس فروم سعودي اريبيا ديورينج ذا كوفيد 19 بانديميك ذا فلور از يورز دكتور عبد الله طيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاه والسلام على سيدنا محمد عليه وعلى اله وصحبه صلاه وتم تسليما اما بعد I'm really indebted and thankful for the uh, group uh, the and the uh, invitation that I received it was generous and uh, it reflects how uh, you guys are keen to do uh, anything that is right and ethical by uh, the Egyptian people and this is actually admirable and uh, I raise my hat for you all guys. Also, I uh, would like to thank uh, the Her Excellency Dr. Uh, Dr. Nadia and uh, the uh, inaugurator Dr. Uh, Henry and uh, Dr. Mr. Francis, the guest who, who just uh, uh, joined from Belgium. Without uh, uh, you, actually, I'll, uh, do, I'll, I'll try to summarize what I, I wanted to share with you here. Uh, clinical trial in general is, in general, is a business. So when we talk about COVID, we have to encounter the fact that we are not only talking about the business of clinical trial, we are talking about something else, unfortunately, which is the politics of it, the medical aspects of it, the social aspects of it, the power of media that comes with it. So uh, with COVID-19 that, that it adds soul to an injury, it's not only uncertainty from the background of, of medicine, like what we do in general kind of clinical trial. It's uncertainty of even questioning what we are starting to receive as what we thought as evidence-based knowledge, like, uh, Dr. Uh, Amin says that uh, uh, papers were withdrawn uh, from the uh, from the Lancet. Also, Dr. Tamer said that. Uh, so, so what to believe in this era of certainty? If you want to look into the the, the review of of uh, approve or disapprove clinical trial in our small regions. In Saudi Arabia, actually, what we did is encounter all of these kind of risks and. Uh, we try to come up with uh, guidelines to uh, look into these kind of challenges and we came up with few uh, recommendations, actually it became low now, that it has to be adhered to when, it, when we talk about clinical trial in COVID when there is a lot of uncertainty. Of course, we are concerned about the scientific uncertainty. Uh, the political uncertainty should be 
neutralize, which is extremely difficult, but we have to, to, to do this difficult job. And another uncertainty also has to be neutralized, which, which is the social uncertainty. Uh, the social power, actually, they are starting now to make a lobby for this drug or that drug. Uh, the, the, we are facing it in some of the uh, decisions that uh, the Ministry of Health took to stop one of, one of those drugs. And the uh, outcry start to burst saying that, well, because uh, the WHO said so, we, are have, we have not to follow. And then question raised about the, uh, about the, WH, the WHO itself. So another uncertainty that we have to take ourselves out if we want to do right by our customers, which is the patients at the end of the day. So after doing the hard job of trying to neutralize this kind of power play that background, it plays in the backgrounds, we have to think about what is the right decision if we want to take decision about clinical trial to go or not to go. The golden rule is what bioethicists call the equipoise. The equipoise basically says that if I am not sure, and I'll put 10 lines after and I'm not sure, between drug A and drug B, which has superiority, now I have an ethical ground to go and indulge clinical trial. Clinical trial, if we look at it and ethical, it's not, it's not it's not ethical if, if I put it in the, in, the, in the trial, unless there is an equipoise. If there is an equipoise, then I have an ethical ground to go and debrave people from, from, from one uh, treatment uh, toward another treatment. And then after uh, the, the, the trial goes, then we will have the answer that we will have, like Dr. Tamer says, either to come up with data to support or or, null hypothesis or, or, uh, uh, or reject the null hypothesis after accepting some certain of alpha and beta errors. So this is basically what our job are, or what our job is. It is not about uh, go into the, 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 the debates or the, the, the uh, debates of whether or not uh, WHO is doing the right thing, whether or not the politics of uh, pushing for this drug or, or that drug is right, whether or not the public wants this or that. Our job is basically look into a very teeny weeny point, which is, is there an, an equipoise or not? And the good news is not the job of the healthcare uh, or, or the uh, IRB committee. It's the job of the principal investigator to convince you guys that there is an equivalence. He has to do some sort of strong literature review. With this literature review, he has to neutralize all the power that we talk about and convince you that his decision is based on evidence that he actually asking for your approval to go ahead under the light of equivalence or under the uncertainty of equivalence. Any other uncertainty is not acceptable. So with that, we have to, cut, to encounter another big fact that should, should be uh, uh, addressed, the elephant in the room, if, if I may put it in, in, in this kind of context, the time. One of the things that we thought about it very carefully in Saudi Arabia is, is the time took to approve research. To do that, we have a very specific law that uh, for clinical trial, any kind of research proposal should not be expedited. However, this is a very harsh time with an extreme uncertainty. And it has to be pushed, but not to be expedited to the extent that we jeopardize patient's care or jeopardize patient or use patient as means to another end, which is either the company's end or the researcher ends. As we know, company has interests, as we say, said that it is business, as well as the principal investigator has his own kind of conflict of interest, which is Eventually, he has a, a research under his name. He will have some, some sort of prestigious outcome. So we have to make sure that our client, which is the patient himself, is protected by making sure that A, all the boxes were ticked. The triangle of, 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 uh, of uh, project management, you cannot have high quality and efficient time and the low cost in the same time. You have to sacrifice one of these two. You can never have these three together. So we still need quality. We cannot jeopardize quality. We still need 
uh, we uh, uh, we still need a, 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 another aspect of this triangle, but we can sacrifice money for the sake to to to, to go ahead with with the other arms of of the uh, of, of of this triangle. So the drug company needs to factor in that we are going to, and this is what we made clear in our regulations, we are going to force as legal authority now, as a Saudi Arabian authority, the IRB committees to come up with quick kind of answer. But this quick answer, which means like we are going to give you an answer within 10, 15, one month if, if, it, if it needs, this comes with the price that need to be paid. It is not the burden of the IRB. And this is another good news for the IRBs is that the government is in their sights. We want you to do your work in a, in, in, in a timely manner, but we are supporting by uh, whatever extra time that you are putting has to be uh, compensated by the drug company who's actually uh, behind this clinical trial or by the person who is actually the, the, the uh, sponsor of this, of, of this trial. Now, with that in mind, with all of these kind of power plays in the, in, the, in the room, we have also to consider the vulnerable group, the children, the pregnant women, the, the elderly. Uh, these, although we, we want to have fast track and we are pushing to protect this kind of uh, finance support for this fast track, we have to pay special attention to children clinical trials. And yesterday there was an, a webinar done by Mr. Francis, who I, I uh, greeted him, to talk about transferability of data in this era of, of clinical trial to, to, toward children. The, we have two problems here. Number one, children uh, are not adults. So even if we believe in the informed consent model, they are, cannot, they cannot uh, uh, consent for that. So whatever you are going to do, you are going to do it with the approval of a proxy who you think, we, we better think that, the proxy is protecting the best interest of the child. So this, has, this assumption has to be validated, who is the person who is giving the, 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 the informed consent and why, what is, what's in what is what is it, what in it for that person when it comes to, to to clinical trial? Because eventually, if anything went south or anything went bad, the child or the vulnerable person who is going to to suffer. Another thing we thought about it is the deferred approval. Now, in this kind of of uh, of uh, fused. Uh, uh, clinical trial uh, with, clinic, with, with uh, the clinical outcome of the disease and how we want to take the right decision, we have to count or to, to put in mind that we are not doing clinical trial for drugs that is completely unknown to us. This drug is in the market for years. It has an FDA approvals for years. But what we are doing is repurposing this drug to Go, go with, with uh, this or that treatment. This in a way give us some sort of ethical leeway to think about it from that perspective. We can put as much restriction as we can, but bear in mind that in emergency situations, you have, as an IRB committee, trust your physician to, write, to take the right decision. I see the voices that would say anything that is out of purpose should be uh, under clinical trial uh, flag. I totally accept that, it's important. But you have to have a policy and somehow in the hospital to say that in an extreme emergency, if you see the patient in extreme need of your best judgment as, as physician, you have to trust that. That his best judgment says that I want to give this drug to that patient and this drug is not used for this specific purpose. From my experience, I think drug X would help uh, the, release the sufferer of this patient right now. So I don't have the, 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 the pleasure of time to write a proposal and ask for approval. So what we did in that, in that kind of manner, because let's remember, there is an, a huge uncertainty in the, in, in, in the era here. We don't know if this drug is superior or not. So if the physician come up with an idea that this drug could be uh, used for an emergency utilization, and this is his best judgment, there is some sort of, of procedure to repurpose the drug and use it for this specific patient, not for 
a trial like five or six patients or even uh, three or four patients. Only this specific patients under close monitoring of the people who's actually uh, uh, monitoring the work for the IRB. And then the outcome should be evaluating if this drug should be reused or, or not reused. This is, again, it's a clinical trial. It's repurposing. I have to apologize for the dog voices. I cannot control them. Uh, however, uh, to continue with, with uh, what I'm trying to say is we have to have some sort of leeway for, for the physician with a trust. But, but having said that, trust comes with accountability. So you trust the, the, the physician that he's taking the right decision right now. But also there is an accountability from the, the IRB committees that they are doing whatever they need to do to make sure that this principal investigator, if we call him a principal investigator in that context, is doing the right thing, not for a personal kind of, of uh, uh, conflict of an interest, but for the best of, of the patient. And if he asks for it again, now the data of the patient who used that, that uh, unconventional treatment should be evaluated. This is just in a nutshell what we've done with uh, the, 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 the up, updates of the Saudi regulations. I hope it was uh, <clears throat> uh, of any help and uh, I'm available for any question. I hope that I didn't took my time and I apologize again for the noise of the dogs. You are most welcome and uh, we enjoyed the presentation of course and we uh, uh, enjoyed also the barking of the dog. <laughs> <laughs> it was very fruitful presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Abdullah. And I think we can start the questions or... Uh, uh, we have a question from Dr. Nadia. Okay. Uh, thank you. I have a question about the challenge of choosing the control group. Because we don't have yet a standard uh, therapeutic modality for the COVID-19. And every now and then, there is a dynamic change in the strategy of treating the COVID-19. So maybe if I will choose a certain modality and then compare it to my medicine in under investigation, maybe I'm comparing the medicine under investigation with a poor modality. Because sometimes we say X modality is very good and then we find in the literature that X modality is not good and then it is retracted again, it's not good, it's good and so on. We are always changing the modalities. Also the group is very heterogeneous because the patients, they are of different ages, of different uh, uh, diseases like heart disease, diabetes, uh, and anxiety, depression. So how can I solve uh, the choice of the control group. Uh, I think this question goes to Dr. Day and Dr. Abdullah, because you talked about the groups in the, in the clinical trials. Yes, uh, can I speak? Yes, yes. please, Dea. Hello. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Nadia, for this uh, good questions. Very good and uh, challenging, brain challenging. You know, uh, we have an experience of this during uh, many of uh, reviewing uh, many, uh, uh, many researches, not only COVID, but, you know, uh, choosing of the control. We have to put in criteria and exclusion criteria for the control group. And it's better to do age and sex matching, age matching, sex matching, because of the variability of the age range. And uh, also, if there are some points to match both controls and uh, and uh, cases, as uh, uh, according to the nature of the uh, objective or the nature of the disease. So this is how to con how to choose the control. And if you increase the number of control groups, for example, uh, more than one to one, two to one, or three to one, but you know this is uh, could be could not be tackled here because we are uh, in a pandemic. Uh, so uh, this is my reply, thank you. Oh, thank you, this is for the human beings, but, but there is another challenge for the therapeutic modality, the best, the best therapeutic modality you will choose to compare with, especially that we don't have a standard modality for the COVID-19. So everyone is choosing uh, a different control group. It's not taking yeah. a standard modality. To compare yeah. with yeah and this is part of the uncertainty of the whole uh, kind of, of era we have to accept that there is a lot of uncertainty and we 
the golden point here is the equipoise. If we are sure that whatever mod modality is available is not superior to the drug that I'm using, then I can yeah. use whatever uh, I think is. Once there is an, 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 an equipoise, <laughs> if I think that the, uh, mo the, that the clinical modality is somehow superior, then you shouldn't do clinical trial. It's unethical. Because what you are doing is deprave the group that you think uh, active group from, from the best treatment known. So this means that you shouldn't do that. It's unethical. The only ethical leeway for clinical trial, if you are not sure if this or that is superior. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Dia and Professor Dr. Abdullah. Thank Thanks. Can I comment on Professor Abdullah, please? Can I comment? Uh, this is a very good uh, good point, but you know, in a very fast disease as pandemic as this pandemic, you know, China has started this hydroxychloroquine in uh, in March, the first uh, the first uh, uh, first pa published paper. Uh, uncertainty is very important, and and equipoise is very important. But can uh, can we ask ourselves, have they done before animal studies? to see the effect of this hydroxychloroquine uh, on animals uh, before, have they, did they have time for this? I think no, so they jumped and they used it uh, in COVID-19. Uh, we know, all of, of us have seen that it uh, has effect in arthritis and in malaria, but maybe the pharmacists uh, or the pharmacology professors say, maybe it has a certain route of action, uh, a different route of action in COVID-19, but there was no time, this is in a hurry, and we all, all we are all at SSS in one channel. So, so yeah. your point is very important, but, but do they have time for this? Yeah, actually, this is the beauty of repurposing medicine, uh, the, the conventional, uh, stages of clinical trials starting from pre-clinical trial which is you use animal clinical trial phase one when you are just making sure of safety clinical trial phase two and and phase three with the repurposing you've done the homework of the first two uh, major part which is animal and safety we know that the, the safe doses that should be given to human and the tolerable doses that should be given to those uh, to those groups so th the clinical trials that start with repurposing is clinical trial phase two and if they are lucky phase three and and uh, post marketing or if we can call it post marketing at that at that stage so of, although, of course, they didn't have time to do animal research, but the beauty of repurposing that according to the policies that you really don't have to. Uh, can I, can I uh, call a comment? Okay, Dr. Amin. Uh, okay, Dr. Amin. The, the usage of hydroxychloroquine and the chloroquine depends on the past history of using it in similar condition in SARS-CoV and in other viral infection as Q fever and so. And so the hydroxychloroquine, uh, 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 we think of, uh, of the result of the efficacy of, the, of uh, hydroxychloroquine depending on the result on uh, similar viral conditions in the past. Thank you. Okay. Thank uh, you, Dr. Amin. Before uh, starting the okay. questions, uh, I think uh, I'll be asking uh, Dr. Amr. Amr, are you here? Dr. Amr Youssef, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Can you uh, present a few words about the Central Directorate? Yes, of course. Okay. I'm going to share you, Dr. Haney. Okay. Uh, next. You, you can share, yeah? You can share, Dr. You have the privilege to share, yeah? Okay. Yes. Yes. yes, but uh, Ali Sochoya, Dr. Am. Hadr. Ayoke the Bath. Salam alaikum, Masail Hira al Hadratkum. I'm Dr. Amr Yusuf. I am acting head of the Central Directorate for Research and Health Development uh, in the Ministry of Health and the Population, and I'm glad uh, to um, uh, present this. Uh, uh, couple of slides regarding the rule of uh, RHD and our uh, rule with the National Research Ethics Committee. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, 
work aspects in uh, our directorate, but uh, I think the most important part uh, and related uh, to uh, this webinar is the re regulatory aspect of the RHD. Uh, actually, we are the operating office for the National Research Ethics uh, Committee starting from uh, 2006. Uh, in addition to, uh, we have a ministerial degree uh, 959 for year uh, 2012, and uh, it goes uh, effectively uh, in 2017. And uh, right now we have about uh, 23 registered IRB, uh, domestic one. Uh, also, in addition to that, uh, we conduct um, an inspection for the approved clinical trials uh, by applying uh, the ministerial decree uh, 614 for year uh, 2016, which comes effectively uh, 2019. Uh, the second issue, we have uh, a collaboration with the uh, NREC here in Egypt, uh, which starts by a memorandum of understanding. Uh, in 2017 and uh, from this point we uh, collaborate in uh, like more than eight events uh, most of them are national one and here we come to the international one uh, and also we collaborate in providing highly specialized training uh, courses for the registered IRBs mentioned before in addition to other aspects of uh, research and uh, bioethics consultation. Uh, regarding the COVID-19, we start to receive uh, our first research project in uh, February 2020 and uh, most of the projects are varied between uh, observational uh, studies in addition to the health system one and intervention uh, studies, what we call the clinical trials. Uh, um, I can say, unfortunately, a lot of proposed uh, to be submitted topics are uh, fabricated one or maybe falsified one or maybe uh, useless uh, research. Uh, also, some researchers uh, who seek advice or try to submit خليني أقول لك كده باللغة العربية وده قول يعني خدته من فضيلة شيخ الأزهر اللي هو في شوية جرأة على العلم. خايف منها شوي في بعض الناس يعني let's try for trying بدون الرجوع لأساسيات حتى البحث العلمي أو الفكرة العامة أو يمكن يحزوهم الأمل أو الدافع إن هم بيحاولوا ينقذوا الناس فده بيخلينا نشوف حاجات غريبة شوي also please take care for clinicaltrials.gov we have a lot of registered studies in clinicaltrials.gov and it's um, registered on uh, um, on the account of uh, Egypt, but most of them are not getting uh, the national approval to conduct this kind of uh, trials. Uh, most of our challenges uh, in the received mm -hmm. studies are regarding the study methods of this study. Is this method uh, is a suitable one for uh, conducting this kind of a study, uh, sample size, etc., and also the scientific writing. Most of them are uh, in hurry or in rush to submit a study, so the scientific writing are get uh, affected a lot. Uh, regarding the National Research Ethics Committee and our collaboration and experience, uh, we're trying to uh, firstly decrease the timelines uh, uh, for the research organizations and entities and the, researcher, and the researchers. Uh, to submit their studies. Also, we uh, organize a fast-track submission uh, by uh, reorganizing our uh, guideline for submission uh, for the clinical trials especially. And also, we accelerate the reviewing process uh, regarding the internal process uh, in the uh, National Research Ethics Committee. Uh, also, after approval of the National Research Ethics Committee uh, in uh, April uh, 2020, uh, we uh, publish uh, this uh, one uh, page guide for the researchers. Uh, it uh, consists of uh, three parts. First part regarding to the uh, basics of the uh, research we are considering when submitting the uh, trials. The second aspect is the uh, uh, required uh, documents to be submitted to the uh, Ministry of Health and the Population. And the third part, how to uh, deal or how to get our uh, guides and how to submit the studies and all the process uh, is the guns uh, 
automatically and in electronic way. Uh, as declared by the MOHB, um, we approved, um, I think, from my point of view, the most important uh, clinical trials here in Egypt. First one was the plasma trial, and second one was the solidarity trial by WHO, and the third one uh, was the vegan trial. Uh, that's it, and thank you for uh, this interesting uh, webinar, and thank you for the panelists and the uh, attendees. Thank you very much, Dr. Amr, for the very informative uh, presentation. We, you gave us a lot about what's going on now in the Ministry of Health. I think, Hany, we can start <laughs> the questions to the uh, speaker. We, we have, uh, uh, we, we ask Dr. We ask Dr. Imam Subih, the okay. assistant professor of chest uh, disease, about to compare the uh, uh, therapeutic protocol from Egypt and Saudi Arabia and uh, uh, how can how can that affect the the research? We are not comparing from the therapeutic point of view. I, I know this is uh, both of them are very good uh, according to the circumstances in every country. But uh, one of the uh, uh, concerns that the Professor Masbeh took about the recovery criteria is different from Saudi Arabia uh, and in Egypt uh, regarding. Uh, 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 how can we diagnose recovery? Uh, because I think in Saudi Arabia they accept this is the opinion of Professor Iman Subeh. Uh, uh, they can accept in Saudi Arabia uh, to document recovery without a BCR. Um, uh, 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 but documentation, uh, uh, every in, in research in Saudi Arabia, are we also uh, accepting? Uh, non-BCR uh, recovery or not? This is a, a question for uh, Dr. Abdallah. I have to be frank, I'm not uh, uh, in touch with the technicality of uh, the uh, Ministry of Health Room of managing the clinical aspects of, of the epidemic and the pandemic, but uh, from the best of my knowledge, they are not allowing any patients to declare that he is or she is uh, good to go and mingle with the city society back without a rigorous system. And in my mind, the rigorous system is BCR. And okay. again, I don't have a rigid information, but uh, this is just from what I know should happen. So I apologize. I'm not uh, one of the technical guys there. Uh, another question, uh, Dr. Abdullah. You talked about the fear of IAB approval. Is this uh, already a, a system in the national committee, or you well, the fear of IAB approval in all yeah. the drugs well, research? Yeah, it's it's the fear of uh, of informed consent. Maybe if I said IAB approval, then it's a mistake. Thank you for catching it. Okay. Uh, the deferred is for the informed consent, not for the IRB approval. Nothing should be started without an IRB approval. IRB approval. Okay. However, sometimes it is difficult to accept, uh, to, to uh, consent patient in a difficult situation. If you think that this, is, this patient is fit for the trial, again, you have an equipoise, but you don't have uh, the right person to, to uh, uh, have the, the, the consent, then in some cases, if the IRV accepted and the IRV should be involved in that decision to uh, enroll the patient and the advocacy of the patient would be the IRV people, the IRV person who is in charge. And then uh, when the patient is awake or when, when the uh, uh, best actually representative of the patient next of kin or uh, uh, attorney power of attorney, Power, power of attorney is, is available, the consent should be documented at that time. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, honey, you finished with Dr. Yes. Iman? Yes. Okay. So uh, I have uh, different questions for uh, the four speakers, uh, but I think one is insisting uh, it is directed to Dr. Amin um, from uh, Professor Kassas and from uh, Dr. Henry at the same time. Both of them are asking, uh, what about clinical trial with arm uh, against placebo? Clinical trial of a new drug and the other arm is placebo and not standard of care, so long that uh, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine are not 
approved or are not the uh, uh, treatment uh, now. Uh, is it accepted as a clinical trial uh, from the Egyptian uh, uh, Minister of Health or the I, th I think that your committee? I think, uh, as we know, there is uh, no approved drugs for uh, treatment of COVID-19 and the standard of care here actually is the support of care and the treatment of the complication. And so this is the standard of care and add on if there is a scientifically valid uh, study uh, to add on uh, the standard, then this uh, standard of care against the uh, protocol of uh, 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 the national protocol, uh, we can accept it. So it's accepted to have, uh, but still, standard of care means inclusion of chloroquine. No. No. So they can do new drug. And the standard if of there care. Is, if there is a scientifically uh, rational uh, and uh, preclinical study and the uh, FDA approved to, do, to, to, to go in, in a clinical trial, we can add it against hydroxychloroquine. Ah, still, I, uh, yeah, yes. not against placebo, because the question is new drug against placebo and uh, hydroxychloroquine not to be included at all. Placebo here is with uh, the standard of care, the actual standard of care, which is the treatment of the complication and supportive measures to uh, the, the treatment. Uh, uh, it's okay. Placebo plus the standard of care, which is the uh, standard measures of uh, treatment uh, of the complication and supportive, actual supportive measures of that uh, patient with uh, COVID-19. Okay, thank you uh, very can much. Can I comment, Dr. Aizda? Can I comment? Yes, please. Go yes, ahead. I agree with Dr. Amin because this is a new disease and we don't have a specific treatment for it. So uh, the national guidelines, uh, they are changed every uh, now and then. So uh, the placebo will receive the national guideline against the new drug. So uh, that's it. The, we can permit placebo. So yes. far we... Uh, no, the question was not to permit placebo. No, the question was against what? Against uh, uh, standard of care. What, what is the standard of care? The question is chloroquine is not approved to be the standard of care. But uh, so you know the, the national guidelines... Uh, so they have to follow the national guidelines. So it yes, needs to be add on. Has, yes, the, national, the last national guidelines that we received, it contains hydroxychloroquine in the three uh, moderate, mild, and severe cases. Okay. So uh, well, uh, here, here a question, Dr. Amin. Are we accepting that uh, uh, in one of the arms, can we stop not all the supportive treatment, uh, chloroquine? Only the chloroquine. We, we, we use uh, in a solidarity trials, uh, for example, Lubinavir, uh, Rutinavir, and table therapy with beta without hydroxychloroquine. So it's a, 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 we are accepting that one of the arm can be without chloroquine. Yes, we, we use okay. here as an arm without hydroxychloroquine. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, thank you Dr. I approved ivermectin uh, to use it in a clinical trial without hydroxychloroquine. Okay. okay. Thank okay. you. Uh, can I start the questions, Yehani? Yes, yes. Yeah, yes. For other speakers. Okay. Uh, generally, uh, everybody is writing to thank all the speakers about the uh, very uh, beneficial presentation. Uh, Dr. Amin, Dr. Tamer, Dr. Dia, and uh, Dr. Abdullah. Everybody thanking you about the presentation. And then we start the question. Uh, Dr. Tamer from Dr. Shadia uh, Darir, she is asking about uh, what about the value of the relative risk and the odd uh, risk reduction? Uh, you have two seconds to answer. <laughs> Take your time, of course. Actually, the relative risk, the odds ratio have the main interpret the, the same interpretation of the p value. Usually we use the p-value or we use the uh, odds ratio or the relative risk uh, according to the test of significance or the, the way of statistical analysis used. Okay. Similar interpretation. 
سواء الـ يعني الريلاتيف ريسك والاود ريسك ريدكشن حضرتك قلت البي فاليو هو بيبقى بدل بالظبط انا ممكن استعمل دول او ما استعمل دول يعني ذا سيم يوز ذا سيم Another question from Dr. Nahid Mustafa and uh, Dr. Muhammad Muafi. They are asking about uh, the consideration of the effective uh, effect size and uh, the effect size uh, uh, and the study error. Both Actually, of them. Uh, the effect size, يعني هو بارع عن statistical concept that measures the strength of a relationship between two variables uh, on a numerical scale. Will effect size of a population can be known by dividing the two population means by their standard deviation. And the truth is that I want to talk about effect size, the significance level increase when the effect size increase. And the effect size is the relationship between type 2 error. And the relationship mainly with the power of the study. And the power of the study is to be used on a lot of things, from the sample size, from the ability to Measuring the effect or the outcome بتاعي is measurable in in a way that decreases the error. So to cut it short and to make it simple, increasing the power of the study will decrease the type two error. And this is يعني the answer of this question. Okay. Okay, I will give you some reference to Dr. Adia. ستاتستكس كتيرة يعني على قدر المستطاع يعني. مشكور يا دكتور تامر حضرتك يعني اديتنا محاضرة جميلة جدا وأنا عارفة إن الوقت كان فيري تايت للمحاضرة. طيب دكتورة ديا دكتورة نجاح سليم أسكينج يو أباوت هاو ماني ريفيورز دو يو هاف فور إيتش بروبوزل؟ أند إيز إت أ بلايند ريفيو؟ وات أباوت كونفليكت أوف إنترست أند وات أباوت ذا ديتا سيفتي مونيتورينج بروسيس؟ Oh, that's a complex question. Then I command a sartu. Yeah, the complex. Regarding regarding the number of reviewers, usually we give for one to to three reviewers in the same specialty. For example, tropical disease in medicine, hematology. He's asking about the COVID nineteen. Yes, I guess I'm asking about COVID nineteen. Yes, yes, because of infectious diseases. So, professor of uh, tropical medicine is, is uh, and uh, internal medicine, they are the most uh, appropriate uh, specialities. So, uh, we give it for two or three viewers. Then we set, uh, the, then we set a, a time or date for uh, the whole REC to have a Zoom meeting. And I send it before the Zoom meeting uh, to send the protocol and uh, to read it in order to prepare themselves. And we, we take our time to negotiate and discuss it. This is the first question. The okay. second, I don't, I don't remember. <laughs> uh, conflict of interest and uh, data safety monitoring process. Uh, conflict of uh, interest regarding what? So we are, uh, we don't have conflicts because most of us, uh, we are not in... Uh, Involved in the proposals. We, ha we are not in the proposal. If someone uh, in the proposal, we... Uh, he says, but uh, we have the list of the principal and co-investigator and co-investigators. We know them. So uh, what, what, what else, please? So the, no, I mean that the conflict of interest is managed as, uh, as normal. Yani no special yes, yes, uh, yes. precautions it's for it. Uh, it's the same. It's the same. Okay. Yes, it's the same. And uh, what about the data safety monitoring process for the COVID-19 proposals? Uh, data safety monitoring. Most of most of them, they have uh, they have a, a sponsoring company, and they have their data safety monitoring. So ourselves, for uh, we have we don't up till now we then we don't have a data safety monitoring board in uh, the ancients REC. We are working okay. for it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Adia. Um, no, again, you you you, you remain with us. Because we have a very important question from Dr. Francis. By the way, Dr. Francis is working for cohort, and I was one of the ambassador, one of three ambassadors uh, for a Mark project for cohort. So I know cohort uh, very well, uh, and I'm welcoming you. Uh, he is asking about. Uh, oh, he is talking. He is writing to the panelists about uh, uh, an application, the Rhino, uh, and this is a very good. Uh, uh, platform for the IRB uh, they can use. We can talk about it uh, later. 
but his question is for you, uh, Dr. Adia. Uh, are all the studies you reviewed in the area of therapeutics, no diagnostics or uh, vaccine? Uh, this is the first question. Uh, one by one, please. One by one. But therapeutic? Uh, yes, yes. We, All uh, are therapeutic? Of them. No, 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 no. Some, many of them are therapeutics and uh, some of them are observational and psychiatric diseases. Some are screening, uh, but we didn't have uh, that uh, up till now. Diagnostics vaccine. or vaccines? Yes. Okay. Uh, another question, I think this will be for uh, Dea and for Dr. Amin, because it's about the percentage of studies uh, in Egypt and outside Egypt, if you have an idea about uh, uh, the percentage of studies outside Egypt, apart from what's uh, in the, on the clinicaltrial.gov, of course. Percentage of COVID studies? Yes. Um, for myself, uh, I have uh, went through today the clinicaltrial.gov. Egypt has 55, uh, 55 studies. I don't know what, uh, uh, what about outside Egypt, but uh, 55 or over uh, most of the uh, universities in Egypt now they have. Uh, so it's a lot, 55 studies. Okay. Uh, she is, uh, he is asking also, Dr. Francis, about uh, do you participate in the solidarity study? Uh, I can give the answer. Uh, yes, uh, Egypt is in the solidarity study. And uh, he is asking about, uh, uh, do we have a national protocol, Dr. Amin, a national standard protocol for research uh, regarding COVID-19? Uh, uh, Dr. Amr will answer this uh, uh, question. And uh, yes, there is a regulation uh, in the uh, Ministry of Health to uh, to, to uh, research protocols in, uh, in our country. Okay, before going to Amr, uh, another one question from Dr. Shadia for you, Dr. Amin. Uh, she's asking about how the sample size and the procedure will help us to reach the scientific validity for the proposals or the protocols you are uh, uh, accepting. The sample size calculation uh, is needed or not needed. Uh, Please give her an answer. Actually, it is needed, but uh, the answer how we calculated is uh, to Dr. Adaya and Dr. Tamir. Uh, we need uh, uh, a uh, public health uh, specialist to uh, answer this uh, question. Okay. Dr. Tamir. Of course, uh, sample size they, I mean, they will affect our, our outcome and will lower the uh, level of error of the study. And this is what I have, I have said also again uh, regarding the type 2 error, which is mainly linked to the power of the test and the power of the test. One of the main important factors that affect the power of the test is the sample size. So calculation of the sample size, especially in clinical trials, is extremely important. If it is okay to, to conduct the, my study with a power which is more than 80% or even 90% with 100 patients, it will be unethical to accept a study that is requiring, for example, 1,000 patients for this study. Uh, so the relation of the sample size regarding our decision in an, an ethics committee, and usually we request the justification from the sample size when we are reviewing a study from the ethical point of view. After finishing the study, uh, um, in, in evaluating the validity of the study. Uh, this have uh, other uh, criteria. Um, when we start to use the concept of the evidence-based medicine to uh, criticize the findings and collecting the data for, from different clinical trials in order to reach an evidence to be used and considered as a standard of care once uh, in, one time, in one day. Thank you, Dr. Tamer. I think we can uh, sum up this issue that uh, regarding clinical, yeah, nothing specific uh, uh, regarding the proposal of COVID-19. I think the only uh, specific thing is uh, to have a, uh, an accelerated review, but otherwise everything is the same. The conflict of interest, the sample size, the inclusion exclusion criteria, you know, all the guidelines or, or the needed elements to be present in any proposal will be 
uh, done during or will be uh, respected during uh, the uh, submitting the proposal for uh, COVID-19. I think, uh, am I right? The panelist, am I right? Okay. Yes. Yes, Dr. Absolutely, Azza. Absolutely, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. Dr. Francis is asking Dr. Abdallah. Uh, he feels that you are uh, trying or you are interested to isolate the IRB or the REC uh, or to protect it from the political and societal pressures. He is asking how can you do this? How can you uh, succeed in uh, isolating uh, uh, and protecting the IRB from the pressure, uh, the political and the societal pressures? And when we are talking about political, when I hear the word political, I can ask you, if you don't want to answer, I think it will be accepted. <laughs> <laughs> I think the best way to isolate them is to prison them or to prison them all and not to allow them to have any kind of social access. <laughs> this is the only <laughs> successful way. To <laughs> so isolate them. Yes. Yeah, of course, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, what I mean by isolation is not the complete total isolation, we are human being in the end of the day, we are going to react to this or that eventually. However, what I mean by uh, what, uh, what you're saying, what, what you feel, Francis, is true. I, I'm trying to, to have the, the, the flag raised that uh, IRB committee should be isolated, but not in, in a physical way. When they come to the table, they have to confront their biases. They have to come clean with whatever political or uh, social power that plays and put it in the table. And any discussion, any point of view has to go with, uh, with clear kind of open heart with why a decision is, is taken. Is it for the scientific reason or because uh, the politics dictates it or because the streets dictates it? So once we are confronting this in uh, some sort of uh, open discussion among the group itself, and we have to trust the group that they are, uh, they are uh, professional enough to do that, uh, everybody should uh, uh, do this kind of ref reflexivity, we call it, uh, acknowledge the bias as, as there is any bias, and then deal with it to the best of, of their knowledge. This is what's, what's needed. So not Talking about the elephant in the room is the problem. Talking about it, make it seen, make it clear, and then take the decision based on the facts rather than the uh, overpowering uh, situation that lays in the background is what needs to be done. And this is what I mean by isolating the final decision from whatever blade, even with the, the uh, IRB members. Thank you. Uh, I have questions from uh, Dr. Iman uh, Sop, uh, and then one more question from Dr. Francis, and two questions to Dr. Am. Okay, let us start by Dr. Iman Sop. Uh, can multicenter clinical trials run against local official pro protocols? I think this is directed to uh, Dr. Amin and Dr. Uh, Abdullah. Can multicenter clinical trials run against local official protocols what is I, the question is not too clear to me i can have different interpretation to it so just to make sure that i'm answering the right version uh, i'm not sure what is the catch what what's the, uh, the actual question i think she means not multi-center i think multinational mm. because uh, uh, later she is asking about um role of clinician in treatment modification in multi again she is mentioning multi-center clinical trials but uh, i think multinational because uh, if it's multi-center and they are in the same uh, country for example uh, in egypt or in saudi arabia like uh, dr amin uh, mentioned before they have to follow more or less the official protocols am i right yeah it's it's uh, so yeah exactly so I think uh, uh, she means multinational. Multinational. Yeah. multinational. She mentioned multinational. Yes. she wrote multinational. Yeah. This is right, as I uh, as I was expecting. So uh, can multinational clinical trials run against the local official protocols? Uh, in another words, role of clinician in treatment modification in multinational clinical trials. Okay, let me summarize what I understood and then I will uh, answer what I understood of, of the question. The question is about the, the, the 
might be appeared as conflict between the local regulations and the international regulations of multinational clinical trials. Yes. And if it's okay to do the, the multinational clinical trial in a diet version of uh, the, the, the local trial. Uh, my response to that, no, categorically no. Uh, every clinical trial invited to be done into the premises of a country need to follow aggressively the regulation of this specific country. Uh, anything else would be uh, any, something like bullying or uh, political kind of, uh, of game or uh, uh, new way of, of uh, controlling medication. So anything else will not protect the best interest of the people who trusted you to protect their best interest. So the only way to accept international clinical trial is to do it by your own local law, uh, following your own local law. And from my experience, uh, the, the international regulators are very understanding when it comes to the uh, international to the national laws, and they they are accommodated to some some level of it. There is no major violation. Doctor Amin, thank Professor you, Doctor Amin. We, we, we have an example. Opinion. I would like to share it with you. Please, okay. please go go ahead, Tamer. Please. Um, uh, yani regarding uh, what's happening on the ground, uh, there is a, a difference between research and practice. In research, we have a study question we need to answer. And not usually, always, the answer of the question is in favor of the study participants. And this is research. And in practice, the main objective is to treat patients. So uh, I think it could be accepted in a clinical trial. Clinical trial. You are, uh, I don't know uh, the answer of the question. And I will not never know the answer of, of the question unless I conduct my study. So why not? to accept or to approve clinical trials, which is not in accordance with the national guidelines, I may succeed by the end of my study in um, uh, finding a new treatment, for example, that can be generalized, and this could be the ideal treatment. And the, 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 there is always a risk in research. And here we should draw a line between research and practice. And usually we said it's very difficult to wear this, the same hat at the same time, two hats at the same time. And uh, the concept of, uh, of therapeutic misconception should be uh, put in our mind when revising as an ethics committee without, I don't know, uh, the, the, the political regulation that regulates the things actually in, on the ground, but this is my personal opinion that I can, as a member of a research ethics committee, I can approve a clinical research or a clinical trial that is not in accordance with the, the uh, national guidelines or the national protocols. This is my, a personal opinion to be discussed Ian, if, you, if, you, Ian, if you accept or reject me. Okay, Dr. Amin. Yes, I completely agree with Dr. Tamir. And we have an example of solidarity trial. Solidarity trial or WHO's trials is a multinational trials. Uh, and um, uh, uh, agree or uh, 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 follow the national call as it. I think you have a problem in the uh, in the voice. I cannot hear you. I think Dr. Amin uh, said that we have already. Okay. Uh, we have already solidarity trial. Yes. We have already solidarity trial with each a uh, uh, a multinational. Uh, trial uh, not follow strictly the national protocol. Okay. Yes. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amin. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tamer, for the uh, answer of this question. Uh, Dr. Francis is asking uh, Dr. Amin and Dr. Adia. Uh, are Egyptian patients willing and uh, willing and ready to participate in COVID clinical trial? from your experience and from what you uh, uh, reviewed, are the uh, Egyptian patients ready and uh, uh, welcoming to uh, be participant in uh, this COVID clinical trials? Um, can I uh, start my comment, my yes, answer? Please, please. As an ethical committee, we haven't uh, yet uh, received any announcement of interim analysis or any, uh, anything from the uh, researchers. 
but uh, as I, as far as I know, uh, we, we knew that some of the Avigan is getting good results. Uh, some of the plasma is getting good results. This is from the media. But, you know, we, we, we don't know. But uh, what we know about our Egyptian uh, patients that they are very afraid of the disease and they are stigmatized and they, psychologically, they are psychologically upset. So uh, I can't uh, answer. Maybe uh, pro Dr. Amin can answer. <laughs> okay, uh, Dr. Amin, please. Actu actually, we, uh, we, we, we don't know if it's a major problem with uh, patients in a clinic trial, like as general uh, speaking. Uh, as we uh, think, uh, most of our patients the Lord's uh, the, uh, and uh, most of them uh, share the, uh, in the clinical trial uh, as general without facing any problem. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Amr with us? Dr. Amr Yusuf? Yes. Okay, uh, Dr. Ahmed Yusuf, BS uh, Alaki uh, Amr, how to contact you for uh, the IRB registration? where Dr. Nahid Mustafa is asking or is asking that the information that you have given, which is the page, I think that it needs to be disseminated and is asking that the national government will be able to give the information in the way of the information in the cases or in the cases of the disease. So, what do you say, Dr. Nahid? Regarding the first question, for registration, هي بالفعل في الوثيقة في لينك موجود هيلاقوا عليه كل الإجراءات بتاعة الوزارة سواء للحاجات الخاصة بالريجوليتري أسبكت أو بالإجراءات الجديدة بتاعة الكوفيد وطبعا الوثيقة متاحة للكل إن هو يشاركها بالنسبة إن اللجنة تصدر قواعد منظمة لبقية اللجان أعتقد ده موضوع يعني قيد الدراسة حاليا ولكن فكرة إنه وزارة الصحة أو ثرايز عمل في الجهات البحثية أعتقد ده شيء محتاج يعني قدر من التروي أو الدراسة المستفيدة فإن شاء الله يعني هوب فولي ده يحصل الفترة الجاية بإذن الله. At least you disseminated يا دكتور عمرو للجان اللي already اشتركت يعني الجان اللي already registered في الوزارة مفهوم واخد بالك؟ طيب الوثيقة هتبقى متاحة على السايت بتاع الكلية بتاع الوزارة ولا هتبقى ممكن تبعتها لنا في الانريك؟ بالظبط هو اوريدي اتبعتت اعتقد الوثيقة اتبعتت للانريك وحصل لها ديسيمنيشن في الانريك طيب بس اسمح لي دكتور هاني مرة أخرى يعني إعادة التوزيع يا ريت شكرا يا دكتور عمرو طيب أنا الحقيقة كده يعني خلصت وما أعتقدش إن أنا فاتني ولا سؤال أي ثينك أي ممكن اسال بعض الاسئله؟ لا انت لا. You are not allowed. لا ويت يا هاني ويت. لا انا كنت عايز اسال. The panelists The panelists agree that هاني ask question after all. I want to take that chance that Dr. Abdullah. More than one week or two weeks. To ask more about the Saudi system. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, regarding the Saudi system uh, uh, of, uh, of IRB approval, uh, is institutional uh, approval is enough uh, uh, for uh, COVID-19 research to be done or you need to go to the National Committee for second revision? No, the, the, the National Committee only regulates what needs to happen in the oh, IRB. It's not a revision, yeah. uh, it's yeah. not revising the protocols. Only there is, if there is a dispute on the okay. final decision. So we empower all the IRBs yeah. to take their own decisions and uh, take the responsibilities of it completely. Thank you. Uh, uh, okay, and I have one question from, uh, I forgot to mention it. I'm sorry for uh, from Professor Osama Azmi. He is asking uh, about uh, clinicaltrial.gov. Uh, as we know, clinical before uh, registering uh, in the uh, on the clinicaltrial.gov, we have to have an approval from at least one IRB. He is asking because you mentioned that some of the studies uh, registered or present on the clinicaltrial.gov are not scientifically uh, more or less scientifically valid. So he is asking how this can be uh, 
and it's reviewed by an IRB. I think it's a political question, but um, who wants to answer? <laughs> So I, can, I can clarify. Uh, I can clarify. Uh, yes, please, Yab. Uh, till now, or till this point uh, of uh, our uh, webinar, uh, we have uh, um, uh, like uh, 54 studies registered on the clinicaltrials.gov related to the COVID-19 uh, and related to Egypt. Uh, from my knowledge, uh, and a lot of studies I have re registered in clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, it have uh, a pathway for uh, uh, submitting the studies which uh, are not uh, uh, guarantee and approval from uh, the IRBs. And uh, if you uh, take uh, a look on uh, this uh, 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 54 uh, trials, you will find uh, 25 of them are not yet recruiting. This means this uh, uh, projects Till now, uh, are not go, uh, going to uh, go uh, or getting the approval of the IRB. Uh, the rest between uh, completed trials or maybe uh, unknown status or maybe suspended or maybe terminated ones. And the active and recruiting uh, clinical trials uh, actually are observational clinical trials. So uh, we are facing uh, like a misleading information about the uh, amount of research uh, conducted here in Egypt in relation to the clinical trial.gov as a database. Okay. Uh, uh, this is my point. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this clarification, مهم عم إنه في طريقة ملتوية للتسجيل في clinical trial.gov. بدون الحصول على موافقة أي لجنة أخلاقية. عموما we are waiting for the database يا عم to be uh, present in uh, the Minister of Health. This is very important, I think. Yeah. Uh, طيب. Uh, another, uh, Dr. Raz, another clarification for every researcher here in this uh, panel now that uh, uh, in our webinar about the steps for approval now during COVID-19. As I as understand that we began from the uh, institutional committee, then going to the uh, scientific committee, then to the national committee. Is this the normal scenario, Dr. Amin and Dr. Amr? I think, uh, yes, this so, is uh, a normal scenario. Okay, thank you. Malish, can you repeat the scenario, Yahani? Yani first it go to the... The, the uh, researcher go first for the institutional review, uh, review board is an institution. Yes. Then to the scientific committee of COVID-19 to accept from scientific point of view the protocol. Then to the national committee before in conducting the research. Okay. So, um, yani whenever you have uh, a protocol for the uh, National Research Ethics Committee, you need to have the approval from uh, uh, the uh, committee of uh, the scientific committee uh, of Dr. Uh, Amin. Uh, 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 I under most, most, most of the uh, submitted uh, uh, research uh, uh, projects and actually the important one of them um, have a previous uh, heavy revising by the scientific committee related uh, to the COVID uh, uh, issue. Uh, and actually in the beginning, we are not uh, uh, receiving an IRB approval from the institution of the researcher and for the GACH of the uh, submitted studies uh, to the uh, ministry, uh, we are trying to minimize it by um, getting just one uh, IRB approval, especially if the researchers are uh, affiliated uh, to uh, a research institution like the NRC or maybe a faculty of medicine, uh, etc. Okay, um, I have uh, Dr. Ahmed Farag is, uh, uh, I will read what he wrote because I didn't get it. Registration in clinical trial.gov does require ethical approval a priori. Oh, but then, however, subject recruitment must not begin before receiving the ethical approval. I think that the 
يعني it's following انه الريكروتمنت ما بيبتديش الا لما ياخد الاثيكال ابروفل بس ما فهمتش الجزء الاول انه بالظبط هو هو كاتب دكتور احمد كاتب كده فعلا غالبا احنا على نفس الارضيه هي المشكله انه بيؤخذ علينا عمليه التسجيل او الحصول على رقم في كلينيكال ترايل دوت جوف وكل ما بنتابع بنشوف انه الارقام بتزيد وده بيفرحنا كبحث علمي ولكن في الحقيقه لما بندخل ان ديبس وللاوير شويه بكلينيكال ترايل دوت جوف وازاي يرجستر عليها الاستادي بتاعته بيدرك جيدا انه لا هي الفكره مش في العدد الفكره مين فيهم اكتف ستاديز او مين ريكروتنج ستاديز ونوع الاستادي شكلها عامل ازاي وطالعه من فين وده بيدينا الايحاء انه فعلا دي ستاديز حقيقيه اذروايز لا انا بعتبر انه ده مش مش حجه علينا اوكي تمام آه في حد بيسال برضو هل اللي احنا عمالين نقوله ده كله بينطبق على الكلينيكال ترايلز بس ولا الاوبزرفيشنال ستاديز كمان مش عايزه انا ارد يعني أسأل يعني حضراتكم حد يفضل يرد دكتور امين دكتور امين اتفضل يا فندم طبعا الاوبزرفيشنال ستادي اخف وطاه من ناحيه الريسك والبينيفيت بس برضه يعني لازم تكون ممثله تمثيل واضح للموضوع اللي هو اللي هو يعني للنقطه العلميه اللي هي اثارها بتثيرها هذه النقطه لازم تجاوب على السؤال اجابه واضحه جدا على اساس انها ما تبقاش يعني تبقى بايزد وتدينا نتائج مضلله عن السيتويشنز الموجوده. تمام شكرا يا دكتور امين. طيب هو بس في طلب من الناس ان احنا حضراتكم تتفضلوا بان تسمحوا ان البرزنتيشنز تو بي شيرد او هو باذن الله التسجيل هيكون متاح بعد كده بلينك واحتمال يبقى موجود على اليوتيوب ان احنا نقدر الناس كلها تشيرت يعني تمام التسجيل بتاع اللقاء الويبينار كله انا بس عايز انوه نقطه مهمه يعني جزء وهقوله باللغه العربيه عشان جزء من بدايه الوبينار دي كانت وجود بعض الباحثين بيقوموا بالاعلان عن عمل ابحاث على مرضى بدون اتباع الخطوات الاخلاقيه والاداريه المضبوطه والعلميه اللي هي قيلت النهارده بشكل مفصل واحنا هنا في الحابس شبكه المسيره جن افراد البحث العلمي والاداره المركزيه للبحوث والتدريب و... و... واعتقد ان صاحب القرار على علم بان في اخطاء موجوده وان اعتقد ان هيبقى في محاسبه احتمال المشغوليات مختلفه دلوقتي والاولويات في الحركه مختلفه لكثره المشغوليات بس اعتقد من ان ان عمل اي بحث من اي شخص علمي او طبيب بغير اتباع القواعد الاخلاقيه المضبوطه اللي هي الدوليه والمحليه اعتقد هيكون لي محاسبه شكرا جزيلا طيب انا بس عايزه مش عارفه حضراتكم يعني انا مش عارفه الاتنديز والكل شايف المسجز اللي اللي بتجي لنا ولا لا بس الحقيقه حابه اقرا دي من دكتور فرانسيس يا هاني هي موجهه ليك اكتر الحمد لله هو بيقول بريليانت ويبينار Much appreciated. I would appreciate to receive an email from the Egyptian Network for Research Ethics Committees, if possible. Uh, uh, sure, it's possible. And also uh, the excellent presentations and the link to the recording. If possible, again, I'm saying it's possible. Thank you, Dr. Francis, for your presence. And thank you for the presence of all the attendees. Um, any more, more thing to add? This is really one of the important aims of the webinar, Dr. Hani, as we can see. Okay, uh, Dr. Nadia, the presenters, uh, do you have anything to add before uh, closing this webinar? I don't want to close it. But any? The voice, Dr. Nadia. Dr. Nadia. Uh. I don't have a question, but I want to thank you all for arranging this wonderful webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your presence, dear Professor. And your thank Excellency you. is always a, an addition, your presence. It's my uh, honor and pleasure. Dr. Azza? Dr. Azza? Yes. 
Yes, <laughs> thank you very much for involving me in this webinar. I really enjoyed it and uh, I got very uh, good idea about what's going on here in Egypt and in Saudi Arabia. And uh, thank you, Professor Abdullah. Thank you, Professor Amin and Dr. Um, Dr. Amr and Professor Nadia. And thank thanks for Dr. Azda and for Dr. Haney. Really, uh, uh, I, I'm looking forward for other uh, webinars. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dea. Dr. Amin. شكرا لحضراتكم يعني انا سعدت جدا بوجودي مع حضراتكم طبعا اسد سيتي وحضراتكم يعني اعلام من اعلام الميديكال اسكس و... واحنا طول عمرنا بنتعلم من حضراتكم ان شاء الله يكون في وجود افضل وافضل وافضل, وأفضل وأفضل ان شاء الله <تصفيق> شكرا يا فندم لوجود حضرتك دكتور تامر تامر لا افتح الصوت يا تامر <تصفيق> يا تامر افتح الصوت Thank you very much, Dr. Haney. This idea of the, the, uh, this webinar actually started by a debate between me and Haney 10 days ago. Um, and yani, it ended by organizing this uh, webinar, and I really enjoyed it. I was very much afraid from uh, talking about uh, sophisticated uh, statistical issues, but I hope that I, uh, yani, I handle it in a way that is accepted by all attendees. Thank you very much. يعني هو انت مجرد انك تشكر جورج قرداحي والمليون جنيه ده كفايه قوي الحقيقه. متشكرين جدا. ثانك يو. It was an excellent presentation. <تصفيق> طيب عمرو عندك اضافه يا عمرو؟ عمرو والله مش لا انا بشكر حضراتكم جدا الاول كريمه من دكتور هاني وان شاء الله يبقى في مزيد من الويبينارز المهمه باذن الله. احنا بنشكر الاداره المركزيه للبحوث والتنميه الصحيه انها دايما متعاونه مع الانرك وربنا ان شاء الله يديم التعاون باذن الله واخيرا وليس اخرا دكتور عبد الله اهلا وسهلا يعني اصحاب السعاده واصحاب يعني الفضل في في هذا الويبينار شكرا جزيلا للجميع تشرفت بدعوتكم اتمنى اني اكون يعني افدت كما استفدت الواقع من وجود القامات الباسقه يعني اللي تكلمت اليوم واللي حضرت واللي دعمت واللي سالت انا شاكر اكرمتوني ايما اكرام كما يقال ولا اعتر بعد عروس زي ما يقول العرب يعني بعد ما تتكلموا انتم خلاص ما في لا لا كلام يقال يعطيكم الف عافيه وشاكر لكم وشرفتموني الله يخليك يا فندم الشرف كان لينا وحضرتك نورتنا اخر كلمه بس حابه اقولها بعد اذنك يا هاني في يعني اصرار من الناس كلها يا دكتور عمرو انه الوزاره تطلع حاجه او جايد لاين دكتور عمرو والدكتور امين طبعا انه تطلع جايد عشان زي ما قال هاني انه يبقى في خريطه او طريقه احنا ماشيين عليها علشان سمعه مصر البحثيه واعتقد برضو المملكه لازم تعمل كده لان سمعتنا لازم تكون في الابحاث على مستوى لائق بينا والا لا داعي للقيام بابحاث واحنا بتسيء لينا يعني ما نعملهاش احسن بدل ما نعملها ويبقى فيها اساءه لعالمنا العربي يعني او بلادنا العربي أنا بالنسبة لي الحقيقة سعدت جدا بإني كنت المودريتور وهاني طلب مني أبقى المودريتور أند يعني كنت ستريست إن أنا هبقى المودريتور للقامات دي لكن الحمد لله أعتقد إنها عدت على خير وأتمنى إنه يكون ال... نكررها إنها تتكرر تاني ويبقى عندنا وقت تاني وطبعا آسفين للإطالة على حضراتكم وإذا كان في أي سؤال أي ميست أرجو إن هو يتبعت وإحنا هنفولو ونحاول نبعته للسبيكر وان شاء الله السبيكر هيوعدونا انهم يردوا علينا بس اي ديد ماي بيست ان انا ما يعني اي دونت ميس اي سؤال انا كتبت الاسئله وما اعتقدش ان انا في اي سؤال كان ميس بالنسبه لاي حد وشكرا جدا للسبيكرز وبجد لتعبكم ومحاضراتكم القيم وطبعا طبعا لازم اشكر هاني ولازم اشكر تامر على الفكره ومش هنسى ابدا ابدا ان انا اي هاف تو ثانك ذا فارماسيست اميره سلطان شديد لطف افورت وال 
الاعلان اللي وصل لحضراتكم ده كان من تصميم دكتوره اميره والحقيقه انا وهاني وتامر تعبناها جدا شيل الاسم ده وحطي الاسم ده حطي اللينك شيل اللينك لا مش هنحط ده شيل الصوره دي الحقيقه ارهقناها جدا فانا بشكر اميره شكر خاص الحقيقه وبشكر حضراتكم واسفه الاطاله واي ثينك زي ما ابتدينا بهاني لازم نختم بهاني اتفضل يا دكتور هاني لا انا طبعا بشكر الجميع بشكر الحضور لان هم الحضور ما شاء الله يعني سواء في التسجيل او الحضور انا عارف ان حصل مشكله في الاتندنس ان في بعض الناس ما عرفوش يخشوا باذن الله هيبقى في لينك للوبينار بحيث ان لا قدر الناس اللي ما عرفتش تخش في المسجلين كانوا اكتر من عرفوا يحضروا هنبقى في لينك وان هم يقدروا يشوفوا الوبينار مسجل باذن الله بشكر الحضور جدا اكتر من ساعتين كانوا معانا والاسئله كانت كلها وكانت مهمه جدا وباذن الله نحاول نرد على الاسئله اللي هي المتبقيه بشكر ضيفه الشرف اسره رانيا زخاري اللي هي طول الوقت بتعمل سبورت لانشطه الانريك ودايما يعني اكثر حد بيسبورت اخلاقات البحث العلمي في مصر وبشكر ضيفنا العزيز الاستاذ الدكتور عبد الله على التشريف وان احنا لان دايما مصر والسعوديه دايما مهمين في التعاون مع بعض وباذن الله التعاون في اخلاقات البحث العلمي نستكمل بعد كده استاذ دكتور امين دكتور تامر حناوي واستاذ دكتور رضيا دكتور عمرو التعاون المستمر مع الاداره شكرا جزيلا وننهي الويبينار ده وباذن الله ربنا يشكرني اشكرني اشكرني يا هاني المشكله الواحد ما يعرفش يشكر صاحب البيت دكتور عز الصالح هو انا بشكرك لانك كنت ممتازه وطبعا بشكر دكتور انا خديكي انا بعكس هاني دكتور هاني مؤسس الادرك يعني ما اقدرش اعكس لا لازم نعكس لازم نعكس شكرا جزيلا ربنا يخليكم ودايما دايما نشوفكم على خير يا رب شكرا جزيلا شكرا جزيلا السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته مع الف سلامه مع الف سلامه